Marvel's Defenders is finally here. It's the show that's going to bring all their Netflix characters together into one series, and people have been hyped for this ever since those shows were initially announced, and their excitement has just increased with every single successful season. Until Iron Fist. Iron Fist was so bad, it caused most people's excitement to turn into hesitation, and it slowed that hype train down to a crawl. And I know a lot of people think that I'm just bringing this up just so that I can complain about Iron Fist again, and I'm not. That comes later. I'm bringing this up simply because you have to bring it up. You have to mention that going into this show, a lot of people who were excited for it, now we're kind of cautious. A lot of people had reasons to think this might not work now. So, it's here. Did it work? Was it another Iron Fist? Well, let's start by talking about the plot. The story starts off by following Danny Rand as he's continuing to chase the hand around the world, only to realize he has to return to New York. But back home, the heroes who had been protecting the city are a bit divided. Matt Murdock has given up being Daredevil, Jessica Jones is out of business, and Luke Cage just got out of prison and he's trying to figure out what to do now. But as they each begin to investigate their own cases, slowly they realize they're all tied together, and that's something I have to applaud this show for right off the bat. The way that they all come together feels very natural. It feels like there's an actual reason why each of their stories would interact. And they accomplish this while trying to stay true to the feeling of each of their individual shows. And sometimes that works. Like when they pull in all of their supporting characters, it really reminds you that each of them have their own lives that they were living, and it makes each of them feel more real. And they also try to capture the tone and cinematography of each of their respective shows, even giving each character a specific color to their scenes. And at first, I was really impressed with this. But as it went on, it made me realize that the thing that made each of these shows special was that they had a real unique tone, a specific theme to them that their showrunners completely understood. And as this show went on, it made me realize this showrunner here can't reproduce that feeling quite as well. It always felt like a replica rather than the original. Again, A for effort because it's damn impressive what he tried to do, but it didn't always pan out. But once the team actually assembles, it stops trying to imitate the feeling of those other shows and it establishes its own tone, its own voice. And that tone? Well, it's just superhero show. That's kind of another negative I have to give it. As I said, all the other Netflix shows had a unique voice to them that made them stand out, that made them special. But this one is just a generic superhero show. And, well, we kind of have a lot of those already. It doesn't make this anything special. If this was on the CW, sure, great, it would work. But this ain't the CW, and four out of these five seasons leading up to this one have raised my expectations above just being a generic superhero show. And I mentioned that this show has some pretty big goals, but it doesn't always hit them, and that's true for many parts of this series. Like, take the action in here. They're fighting an army of undead ninjas, so yeah, it's going to be heavy on the martial arts, and half the fight scenes look great. I'm genuinely impressed with them. But the other half is just a jumbled, fast-edited mess where you can't tell what the heck is happening. Or take the hand itself. Now these Netflix shows have had some great villains that are really memorable, and Alexandra, the leader of The Hand played by Sigourney Weaver, she's actually pretty interesting. She's an immortal who is afraid of dying, so she's decided to speed up their plans because she's learned that after hundreds of years of being alive, her body is finally giving out and she doesn't have long left in this world. That's pretty unique, and Weaver plays her with a more quiet, soft-spoken tone that shows just how cold and calculating she really is. However, the rest of the Hand? Yeah, who cares? There are four other leaders of the Hand, and none of them are memorable or interesting at all. Even Madame Gal, who in Daredevil and Iron Fist was one of the best things about those series, is just reduced to being a second banana in this show. For guys who are supposed to be the heads of a gang of immortal assassins, yeah, they are so bland. Each of them has something that makes them different, but not something that makes them cool. Not something that makes you want to see more of them. Like for example, there's one guy who when we first see him, he's cutting up a giant bear and talking about being a great hunter and the thrill of the hunt. Oh, so he's going to be kind of like a Craven the Hunter style character who specializes in tracking and he's going to have all these hunting themed weapons and yeah, no. He's 
just another random martial arts guy. That's it. And when you think about how many great villains exist within the Marvel Universe, and what a wonderful job they've done interpreting these villains into these Netflix series, and how many villains could have worked in this role, and then you realize they didn't use any of them. They just created their own characters, and only one of them is mildly interesting, it kind of adds insult to injury. Like, if they had used characters from the comics, at least you could have said, well, I see what you were going for, but you just didn't interpret them correctly, but at least it was kind of cool getting to see them in there, and at least you tried. But here, it's like, oh, you didn't even try. You just thought that these characters you were creating were more interesting than the ones in the comics, and they weren't. They just kind of sucked. And speaking of characters who just kind of sucked, let's get into it. We all know that the showrunner of Iron Fist was bad, so we all hoped that Finn Jones would be better if he was in the hands of someone else. And honestly, yeah, he is. Sometimes. For a large portion of this show, Iron Fist is still being the super angry mopey frump boy that he was in his own show where he constantly looks like he was going to throw a temper tantrum in the supermarket because he couldn't get the cereal he wanted. And the fact that this season very largely revolves around him makes that even worse. He is the MacGuffin that everyone is trying to get their hands on, so he's front and center for much of this. However, when he actually interacts with the other defenders, especially with Luke Cage, he's actually not bad. In fact, there's a whole episode that they spend with these characters just interacting in a Chinese restaurant, and in that episode, he's not angry. He's not doing the stupid half-whisper Batman voice. He's actually speaking like a normal human being, and he's chill, and he's having a good time, and he's actually, dare I say, good in this episode? Yeah, when that's the version of Iron Fist we get, he's actually not bad, and I'm hoping that the people who worked on this show actually realize that's the Iron Fist we should be seeing, because there are many moments in this show where it actually feels like they even went back and added in new lines and new interactions specifically because they realized the problems with the Iron Fist series and they realized they needed to address them. There are many characters in here who straight up called Danny out on the problems people had with him in his own season. And no spoilers, but where this series ends, it kind of implies that they realize, yeah, we shouldn't do this again in season two. I'm not saying I think he's going to be good in season two now, but this show made me realize they're going to try and fix him. In fact, Danny isn't the only one who is at his best when he's interacting with other characters. All of them step it up a notch in those moments. The best Daredevil scenes are between him and Jessica Jones. The best Luke Cage moments are between him and Iron Fist. The best Jessica Jones moments are between her and the rest of this team. And this is a team show. So whether it succeeds or fails lies in how good these characters are together, and they're actually fantastic. So in the end, how does this series stack up just as a TV show? Well, for most of the positives, there's a negative as well, but in the end, the chemistry of this team, as well as the shorter number of episodes making the story feel more focused, as well as some damn good twists and turns in the last few episodes, really did make this show something I'd consider a success. I know I complained about a lot, but that's because aside from the character interactions, the best stuff in this show is all story related, and it's all spoiler territory that I can't really go into, but I will say that when I found myself saying, yeah, this has been pretty straightforward and there aren't going to be any great twist, that's when there would be an amazing twist. And where this show ended was a fantastic moment for one of these characters that was actually kind of an emotional gut punch. However, before I get into my final score, there is one last piece of disappointment that I have to bring up with this show, because I'm a comic book fan, I know that many of my viewers are as well, so I'm sure that if I felt this disappointment, at least a couple of you know what I'm talking about. You see, one of my favorite things about the Netflix shows has been just spotting all the stuff from the books. Not so much just because it's nice to see an Easter egg, but because as someone who's read the books, we know that they're referencing larger storylines. We're referencing where these characters could go, other characters that could pop up in the future, and we are watching as they slowly become the characters we know that they are destined to be. And in Defenders, there's almost none of that. Not until the final episode is there any, oh, it's that thing moment. There's no Easter eggs for seven episodes straight, 
It's just watching this, hey, let's fight ninja storyline. And honestly, you need those Easter eggs. You need those hints at larger storylines because that's what gets a certain portion of your audience hyped up. Again, not because it's, oh, I know that reference, but because it makes us go, oh, I can't wait to come back later and see where this goes. I can't wait to see how this might play out in season two, three, four. I can't wait to stick with this and see what those little hints turn into. And there really is practically none of that in here. In fact, there are even certain storylines you were waiting on panning out in this, such as the origin of Night Nurse, and that's completely non-existent. It felt like all these series were leading up to that, and nope, nothing. In fact, even if you don't know the comics, you know that Claire has been connecting all these characters together, so you figured she'd have a big role in this show. Yeah, not really. She doesn't really do squatting here. She should have had some big moment that plays on how much the audience has become attached to her, that plays with how she's been the heart of these shows that's connecting all of them together, and no, she doesn't really get anything. It's actually kind of insulting how she connects all of this together, and yet none of that pays off in this big final show that actually connects it all together. So, in the end, as I said, for every positive, there is a negative. But the thing that makes me lift this up above being just okay, and it does make me overlook many of the negatives, is the characters. It's watching all of them come together and interact, because in the end, that is what we wanted to see. We wanted to see these individual worlds colliding, and in all honesty, I think they succeeded at that. When these characters are together, that's when this show is at its best, and that's when this show should have been at its best. So because of that, I'm going to overlook many of my problems, but I can't overlook all of them. And that's why I'm going to give this show a 7 out of 10. Let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts on this series were. And if you want to see my spoiler talk, then we have two episodes right over there. Also, you can always follow me on Twitter at Professor Thorgy. And if you like this episode and want to help us out, then hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and share us around the web. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time.